Follow along as we build a fitting tribute to the Land Rover Defender. This series is brought to you by LR Centre Limited and Frost Auto Restorers. And SIP Industrial Products. It's been blowing a gale outside the workshop this week, but we're pushing on with our rebuild. Recon gearboxes have done a brilliant job with our R380. We'll be able to drop that into the chassis very soon. Using the frost shot blasting cabinet, we've been able to clean and paint our old calipers as well. We have the standard Land Rover style uh, shock turrets here. And these cone ones are, they're made from, I don't know, two, three mil metal that's pressed and then welded together, um, spot welded I think. <clears throat> these are okay and um, the reason I put these on is because I had I had tubular turrets fitted to this vehicle before it was stripped down and they were poorly made, very cheaply designed and produced and they corroded really quickly. I think they were zinc plated or like sheridized and uh, it was just a bit disappointing. So, because of the way we're building the entire Land Rover to be as though it came from Land Rover itself, we're trying to keep it quite standard. And I thought, well, I'll put the old school kind of um, cone shock turrets on and it'll just look okay. I went for Garv ones because these do rust quite badly. So, I was fairly happy with that decision, but then we had some comments on the forum post we're running for the build, which quite rightly said, hang on a minute, you know, you're trying to do this better than Land Rover, which is our ultimate goal. And you've put these old school closed shock turrets on, inside of there it fills up with rust and it's not the best option you could have gone for. And you know what? They were right. What was recommended to us were Gwyn Lewis type shock turrets. These are made by Gwyn Lewis 4x4. We're fitting these Gwyn Lewis shock turrets because, firstly, they're much, much stronger. Gwyn Lewis have designed these to be suitable for challenge events and, and expedition over land vehicles, and they're made of a six millimeter steel. A lot more material there, very strong. They've been galvanized, which gives us long-term protection against corrosion. The build quality is far superior to any other product I've seen on the market for something like this. For example, the welding is absolutely beautiful, the galvanizing is really good quality, and it's been dressed up so there's nothing you have to do. You literally unwrap it and you can fit it straight away. The open sides allow you to get a power washer in to clean out and maintain the shocks, and you can also replace your shocks without having to remove the turrets after you've fitted these. Also, there's one of these turrets to suit everyone. There's a standard height turret and a 2 inch extended one and both of these can be supplied with or without dislocation cones built in. First we're lifting the chassis to free the spring from its seat, then we can remove the aftermarket turret ring that we fitted before and we'll replace it with a matching Gwyn Lewis heavy duty turret ring, again very well made. The easiest way to do this on a assembled vehicle is to remove the shock nut that's on the lower of the damper then you can remove the access panel and the wheel arch liner and then if you unbolt the turret you can lift the turret and shock out as a complete assembly. You're then able to remove the old turret ring though that might require you to use a pry bar because of the corrosion that seizes it in place sometimes. I'm going to remove the four nuts to, that secure the turret ring in place. 13mm socket. If you were doing this on a car I might find it easier with an extension, but I'm not. Coincidentally, these will be for sale if anybody wants these. Send me an email, hello at funrover.com. So once we've uh, got it to that stage, where the nuts have been removed, then we can just give a little wiggle and lift that out. That's why it's easier if you leave your shock in, because you can just pull the whole lot out as one assembly. And the ring two, that's come out. If this was your chassis, then you could clean up this area while you've got access to it. Always a good idea, so you haven't got salt and muck and dirt in there. And then we can fit our heavy duty turret rings from Gwyn Lewis. The quality of these is 
spot on. When I fitted the shock turrets from uh, the aforementioned company, they required a bit of filing because the galve was in these holes, which is a normal thing, but it's just annoying. And uh, I've not had that problem with Win Lewis. They've just prepared everything themselves. So when you get it, it's literally ready to fit. And I like how you get a little bit of instruction, um, even in the packages. With the turret ring, we've got a nice little slip here that tells us the torque settings for the nuts, which is just, you know, it's just a nice comprehensive package. Then I can slide the turret ring into place. Like so. And those, as I mentioned, fit first time, absolutely spot on. The company have drilled out the holes for us and it's a really pleasing fit. And with the included lock nuts, we can then just fasten those down. There's four of those. Now, ordinarily we recommend copper grease, but we were speaking to Gwyn and he recommended molly grease instead. Now you see, the difference is that this doesn't have a metallic compound in it like copper slip does. So theoretically, you're not gonna have any galvanic reaction from the copper itself. So it's a non-metallic non grease that we can use as an anti-seize compound. So we'll put that on the bolts and give that a try. This is available on the Gwyn Lewis website and you can get grease guns to easily apply this if you're doing a big job like a rebuild. Then using a small torque wrench, we'll set the torque to 24 Newton meters or 17.7 foot pounds of torque, which isn't very much at all. Don't forget, always grab a torque wrench by the handle. So 24 Newton meters, is just nicely nipped up. Now, a really cool benefit of fitting these open-sided shock turrets, in addition to the ones we've already mentioned, we can remove and refit shock absorbers without taking the turret off. So a shock absorber will actually just slip in there, and then all we have to do, fit our bushes, and the damper washers, and then the top nut. And that will save you a considerable amount of time if you ever need to replace the shock absorber. So, would I recommend these Gwyn Lewis shock turrets? Absolutely, hands down, yes. They are one of the easiest items I've ever bought for a Land Rover to fit, and they just work perfectly. The manufacturing and finish, as I've said, is brilliant. The galvanizing is really good quality. It's been cleaned up filed and drilled out, ready for us to put straight onto the vehicle. And they offer numerous benefits, such as being able to examine the condition of our dampers, to be able to clean them, and also to be able to fit and refit them much easier than the standard style. Also, they're a lot stronger. So overall, a fantastic product. Check them out at gwynlewis4x4.co.uk. Now onto the engine block painting. Okay, so I'm just using a bottle of Stop Quick by Swafiga Brake and Clutch Cleaner. This, the, the most important thing about the cleaner you use is that it contains nothing that's going to leave a residue once you finish painting it on. So when this is dried and cured, there's nothing left behind. We can paint almost onto that surface if we wish. Just using the brushes that I showed you last time to agitate the surface, get rid of rust, oil, muck and carbon deposits. And these spray balls are nice because they've got a pretty high pressure nozzle. And it's just a case then of removing all of the oil deposits and stuff that's cured onto the engine and really set on there. And the oil is coming off in rivers, which is great. So then we can just use our brush, agitate any areas like that. And this is uh, the, the first step really in the engine block preparation for painting. We need the surface to be entirely oil and contaminant free. Aluminium areas such as this cast front cover should be treated with POR15 metal prep 
available from frost.co.uk before painting. We took advantage of the cleaning solution to clean the uh, sump as well at this point. Then we gave it a final blast down with the air gun to ensure everything's dry. We'll use a scotch bright pad just to scuff off the old paint that's there. Now that takes the shine off and we'll promote adhesion. We want to go around the engine block doing that. Once we're satisfied that the engine block is completely clean, we'll set about painting it. I'm putting on a single coat first and I'll let that dry for, I'm just going to leave it overnight. Then when I come back for my second coat, which can be a little heavier than the first one, then I'll leave that again to dry for 24 hours. And then finally the manufacturer of the paint, Paw 15, they recommend that you don't start your engine for six days after you've finished your final coat and that's just to give you a really good curing time. Being careful not to paint in any other bolt holes, not to get drips but to put enough on so that the coat flows out and you can't see your brush marks. It's a really nice enamel to work with this. You can buy it at frost.co.uk for £15 of tin and it's about a pint you get and that should be more than enough to paint an entire engine block. As you can see I've done the other side already and hardly even gone into my paint yet and yes this is the final build colour a pastel green I know it's a very popular colour nowadays but I like it this is ultimately going to be my car that I'm going to keep for quite a while so that's the colour I've gone for I'm using a good quality Harris brush they're a little bit more money but well worth it because your bristles are better made they don't come off as you're painting getting stuck in the paint. They give you a really nice brush free finish and uh, I've just used them because my dad always used them when he was painting and my dad always used them because my granddad he would use them. He worked for a paint manufacturer as a sales representative so he recommended Harris brushes. You can get them from B&Q and stuff, they're not like special but they're just a much nicer brush to work with. And when, you, when you're doing something like this, you know, why give yourself the extra headache of a cheap brush? Here's the finished product. The engine enamel colour we used was Buick Green, as that matched quite closely our pastel green paint. There's a number of different colours available. Check them out on frost.co.uk. Okay, so I'm going to replace the engine mounts and refit those now. This is the old one, and because of the mileage it had covered, I decided to replace them. They're not actually that hard to replace, apparently, these when the vehicle's built up, which is a surprise. But um, a worn one can cause knocking noises. So I decided to replace it with a set of new ones. These are pattern parts. Really uh, good condition, good quality ones, though. Almost exactly like the original, I'd say. So let's go about fitting those. The manual said it was an M10 bolt. Or the parts listing for it did. But the hole, I would say, is an M12. So make of that what you will. We're talking these bolts to 85 Newton meters. Then dropping on the down pipe heat shield that we shot blasted in our frost shot blasting cabinet and then treated with a high temperature silver spray paint. Engine mounts work by damping jarring movements that could be transferred to the engine or the vibrations that the engine produces from transferring into the vehicle frame or chassis and surrounding fixings. Using a combination of a thick outer rubber with an inner void and then an independent center bush, movements in all directions are greatly reduced. Finally, we're fitting our fuel tank and guard. In the TD590, the fuel tank sits between the chassis rails at the rear. There's no other fixings of such. The tank is held in place by the guard, the chassis rails at the side, and the bottom of the tub on top of the tank. The old one, as you can see, is heavily corroded. So we're upgrading this one with one from Paddock Spares, a heavy duty galvanized replacement. 
Fitting it is very simple. We use the trolley jack to lift the guard into place rather than scrambling around on the floor trying to awkwardly lift it and offer it up all at the same time. This reduces the likelihood of dropping it or it slipping and damaging some of our paintwork. The holes for the bolts on the guard are slotted, which allows some flexibility in fitting and that compensates for Land Rover manufacturing tolerances, but these haven't been cleared out fully, so you may have to gently file excess galvanized material away to get your bolt to fit. These are M12 fixings. All these bolts had K45 molly grease applied from Gwyn Lewis to prevent future corrosion. The rear cross member has three captive M10 nuts on the underside that also mount the fuel tank guard. I've got to say this fuel tank guard from Paddocks is very good value for money. When I looked it was actually probably the cheapest fuel tank guard made of steel that was galvanised that you could buy. And apart from a little bit of filing which you know you have to expect with galvanised products, you didn't really have to do anything, it just fit up very nicely. It is so strong, I could stand on that, it would take my weight no problem. It's made out of again I think a 6mm steel and it's got really cool rally raid style drill outs so if you're into that kind of thing but yeah really nice product really well made and you can find it on the paddocks website we hope you've enjoyed this episode of fun rover tv you can see our last episode here and also check us out on funrover.com we are at fun rover on twitter and instagram and we're also on facebook <laughs>